Jailed on suspicion of murder, Ted Bundy escaped from the Pitkin County Courthouse this afternoon, evading the authorities. He was acting as his own lawyer, so he was allowed to use the courthouse law library without really supervision. Maybe a guard was out in the hall or standing by the door. The jailers were foolish enough to take his ankle bracelets off. And then he jumped out the window, he sprained his ankle, he walked along the river. He ended up breaking into a cabin up in the mountains. There was a manhunt for him all over the country. And then he got caught driving through Aspen at 2 o'clock in the morning in a pink convertible. So then they arrested him. Uh, I don't like being locked up for something I didn't do, and I don't like the people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. I was the first person he called, and I flew to Aspen at his parents' expense. Ted was sleeping on the floor, and the guards said, hey, Bundy, wake up. You got a visitor. And Ted woke up, and he rubbed his eyes, and he looked at me, and he goes, hey, John, did you figure out which one of those two guys pushed me out of the window? And I didn't think it was very funny, and neither did the officers. He was always trying to manipulate or charm me. He failed at both. He had just been charged with murders in Colorado. So Ted asked me during that conversation where a person would go to most likely get the death penalty, which I thought was an odd question, to say the least. And then I said, without hesitation, I said, Florida or Texas? Because their statutes had recently been upheld by the Supreme Court. Once he escaped from Aspen, they put him in a newer jail in Glenwood Springs. They intend to place the accused murderer in a high-level security risk cell. But I interceded with the authorities in the Glenwood Springs jail to get him access to the phone, access to the mail that was not censored between attorney client, to improve his diet with uh, the health food and things he was eating. These are constitutional privileges which any defendant in jail should have. Later, when I saw him in Glenwood Springs, it was amazing to me how much weight he'd lost. And he was also working out a lot. He was very muscular, very thin. And this didn't occur to the jailers that, you know, why is Ted losing all this weight? You might go, well, maybe there's an issue with this 12-inch grate in the ceiling. The county sheriff's office from Aspen called and said, son of a bitch is gone. He escaped. People to this day have our time myself have our time believing that the authorities let him escape twice. So it involved a lot of planning, and he was in a cell right next to where the jailer slept, and he knew the jailer left on Friday nights to go visit his girlfriend, which led nobody in the jail, security-wise. So he went, I mean, just like the movies, he went through the ventilation grate and then threw the ducting into the jailer's closet and then went outside to a blizzard. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know if Bunny would head to Seattle. But I did fear that every time he escaped, he could kill somebody. I felt guilty and I think emotionally upset that I had helped him get into the shape he needed to be in, basically, to escape again. Because I knew that if Ted was loose, he would kill again. After Ted's second escape, Ted takes a bus from Vail to the Denver airport, and he got an airplane to Chicago, and then went from Chicago to Ann Arbor, because he always hangs around universities. And he said he was watching the Rose Bowl when there was a little ticker along the bottom of the show saying, Ted Bundy escapes a second time. I was very concerned. It was just only a matter of time. I knew if Ted Bundy was loose, period, he would kill. I was sitting in my office in Pioneer Square in Seattle. It was 7 o'clock at night. And my answering service calls me and says, there's a Mr. Rosebud on the phone, and I knew immediately it was Ted. I do know he asked John when he was in Colorado, where would they most likely put me to death in the United States? And John said Florida, and that's exactly where Ted went. And in Florida, he broke into the Kyle Mega house and killed Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. Then he brutally beat three more sleeping co-eds, Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner. Cheryl Ann Thomas was severely beaten in her apartment six blocks away. And then we killed Kimberly Leach in Tallahassee, who was 12. 
She was walking home from school. So he got caught, as he got caught in Utah, driving around drunk. He's arrested, and he's in jail, and they don't know that he's Ted Bundy. And that's when he called me. And that conversation was the most bizarre. I mean, he sounded more crazy than I'd ever heard him before. He was changing subjects. He was using other tenses. I think it was alcohol, but I think he was also having a psychotic episode of some kind. Uh, and I think he was calling me to just let me know that he was in custody and, you know, what should he do? I said, Ted, you better tell him who you are. You know, at least you sound like you're being cooperative. He was picked up for something minor, so I assumed he would be released probably the next day. And if Ted Bundy was released, he would kill again. I wanted to call the authorities, but I didn't because the attorney-client privilege would prevent me from doing that. You can't talk about any communications with your client without the client's approval. So it was a real dilemma for me, my conscience, my heart, um, you know, having lost um, a woman friend to a murderer. Uh, it was all playing through my mind. And, and it really was a, a, do I want to be a lawyer anymore? That went through my mind that night a lot. Do I want to be in this position again ever? I picked the phone a number of times to call the task force and then put it down. And I called a friend of mine who's a law professor and he said, well, under the ethical rules, you can't do that. And then the human part of me was going, you need to do something about this. So it was a very, very difficult evening.